Dunks and Prism, Most High Kings, Glacia, Queen Omega, Lion, Fate and Strain. forecast for the upcoming year, just to give us a vision of what we can anticipate so that we can align with the, the, the movement of, of space-time for that upcoming year. And uh, when she saw the presentation, she said, yeah, Ross, when, when you come up to New York, that's what I want you to share and tie it in with the Star Nations. Yes. So I was like, whoa. <laughs> but. Uh, I got still, created a game of the vision. So, you know, uh, I do have some powerful information to share. It's tough coming after the brethren Joel. Because I'm all on my home, but that brethren's fire. I'm an Aries, full of the fire. I'm Pisces, you know. I'm on the mellow, mellow fellow. But hopefully, uh, you know, the, the, the information will stand for itself, you know? And what, what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna break it up in two parts. I'm gonna do the forecast and then switch over to what we can anticipate seeing from the Star Nations that up this coming year. So, uh, you know, honoring time, if, if, if you feel like you can't hang for part two, I understand I'm not gonna take it personally. All right. Oh no, they gonna stay for part two. Don't come with that. They All right. Yes, sir. Hey, the brethren, the brethren commanded, so it be. Yes, sir. All right. All right. All right. Friday. They ain't going to That's right. It's Friday, so we can just <laughs> relax on into this, you know. So 2015, 2015. This is a power year. Y'all feel it already. I know, right? Very different frequency from 2014. We're gonna talk about why. But it is definitely a year for the Magi State. The Magi State. You know, we're going to talk about that, what that means, all right? So, uh, really want to open up by, uh, when we say, by, so when we say Magi State, right? So Magi is someone that creates their own reality. So really, we're all Magi's, right? Yes. Because we all create our reality. The, the thing is, are we consciously creating our reality, or are we just kind of uh, allowing the programming that filters through our mind, you know, create our reality through us, you know? And, uh, but the thing with a Magi, right? Not only is the Magi creating his or her reality, but you're doing it in the moment. It's an instantaneous manifestation, a synchronistic manifestation. And one of the, year, one of the reasons why 2015 
is, is a year for the Magi's because we're still in that accelerated time that, that really is kind of associated with that 2012 phenomenon. That 2012 phenomenon, you could really call it the pinnacle of space time where the Olmec Maya nation, they view time as like a step pyramid that had nine levels to it, right? Each level was, uh, what do you say, proportionally smaller than the level that it sits on, right? But the same amount of change occurs in that time, right? So at the base, you, you're dealing with a time span of 16.4 billion years. That's like we're going forward with them, what Western scientists call the Big Bang, right? It's not until you get to the fourth rung that we're even in a, no, excuse me, one, two, three, four, yeah, the fifth rung that you get into even what we what, what 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 Western scientists would call history. You know, this this is like the epoch of ancient Kemet, right? The next epoch you could really say kind of corresponds to the dispensation of what we would know historically as the United States. And the impact, you think about the impact that this nation has had in terms of the relationship that humans have with time because of technology, right? Where it used to take months to traverse the world. It used to take months to communicate intercontinentally, right? When, with the advent of what they call the United States, all of those things began happening much quicker to where we can really say we've been, you know, by the time we're up here, the next rung, right, the world is very small. We're dealing with a global community, right? You got the World Wide Web, right? Instantaneous communication. You can travel, you can travel halfway across the world in a day, as opposed to months, right? So even though this rung, which is the eighth rung, was like only 13 years, same amount of change occurred on this planet as it did in this bottom rung, right? Then when we got to 2012, two, 260 days, we had this quantum change occurring. Then once it got past that, Winter solstice of 2012, you had an inverse. So visualize you, you, you're, you're moving up in a spiral. Once that spiral reaches its critical point, the, the tightest point of the spiral, it has nothing to do but to begin to unspiral, going in the same direction, right? So this is where we're at, where past the 260 days on the other side, right? And we're in about a 13 year, 12, 12 and a half year cycle where it's going to kind of feel like time is slowing down a little bit, right? <clears throat> but we're still in accelerated time, synchronistic, like, these two, 260 days on either side, it was like instantaneous manifestation. And truth be told, a lot of us experienced that time as, as chaotic. Because we had to really, we had, we had to be in that masterful state in control of every thought and every emotion. Otherwise, you know, random thought would be creating random experiences. Toxic emotions going to be creating toxic interactions, you know? But now we're in this synchronistic flow, right? Where 
we got a little bit of wiggle room with time. It's not instantaneous manifestation, it's synchronistic manifestation. So we don't necessarily have to be in control of every thought, every feeling, right? Just most of them. If you can be in control of most of your thoughts, most of your feelings, the way we're in this accelerated time, we can manifest that magi. Y'all with me? Yeah. All right. So that's that's just kind of generally where we are as far as the, the movement of space time and how fast it's going, right? And I'm sure we all are experiencing it. You think something before the day is out, it's manifesting somehow. You think about someone before the day out, you're connected. Am I right? All right, this is why. And it's a blessing. Okay, so we gotta work it. Because we got till 2025. All right, we got 10 years of this speed of time left. Okay? So now, uh, I like to, when we look at annual forecasts, it's good to have some type of frame of reference. Right? So we all were, we already went through 2014. We're going to use 2014 as our frame of reference when we talk about what we can anticipate coming up. Right? So 2014, this is a chart opening up the year of 2014. You see we opened up with a grand square in the cardinal signs. Right? Squares. We build with squares. You never see no foundation of a building spherical. Because spheres move. Okay? Spheres have volatility just in their design. Squares and oppositions, that's what we build with. Beams and girders as squares and oppositions. Okay? So now, squares and oppositions hold tension, they hold pressure but they're stable. Y'all with me? So when we start our year with a grand square, that's what we're dealing with, okay? It's gonna be stressful, but the potential to build something stable. And I think that's a good way to characterize how 2014 was. It was a stressful year, I know for me, I went through some personal judgments, you know? But, I, I also have like built good foundations, been able to grow a lot of projects, you know? This grand square was in the cardinal signs, okay? And what was really most significant that I want to point out is that the planet Pluto was hard conjunct the sun at the beginning of 2014. We're going to talk about that. But this was really the keynote of that grand square, the sun-Pluto conjunction. Squaring Uranus and Aries, opposing Jupiter and Cancer, and squaring Mars and Libra. Okay? So this year, we start this year, next grand square. But it's different this time. Grand squares and the mutable signs. Okay? So you got Neptune and Pisces squaring Taurus moon, but it was at that critical degree, one degree away from Gemini, opposing Saturn and Sagittarius, and squaring the Pars fortune, the place of fortune in Virgo. All right, so mutable signs, cardinal signs is all about initiating change. Mutable signs are all about reaping, manifesting change, okay? And we mentioned these squares and oppositions, it's all about stability. It's stressful, but it's stable, okay? So, yeah, I think there's gonna be a lot of change this year. 
lot of change becoming evident and manifest in our lives, but we're going to be able to maintain stability through that change. Okay? And uh, the keynote, the keynote of this square is you got Saturn ingressing into Sagittarius. We want to talk about that. Saturn is one of the slower moving planets. It takes about two and a half years to transit through a sign. So the last two and a half years, Saturn was in Scorpio, judgment. Okay? But now Saturn is moving into Sagittarius, opposing the moon. Okay? So that says that we got a Saturn opposition moon beginning of the year. We got emotional healing to do. Emotional works. We got to work on it. Moon rules our emotions. Saturn rules our work responsibility requirements for discipline. Right? So we know that we are all carrying stored trauma. And some left. Post-traumatic slave syndrome, post-traumatic war syndrome, rape, abuse, molestation, right? Got a lot of uh, 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 domestic abuse, okay? We all got a lot of stored trauma in us. This is a year, 2015 is a year to commit to work on ourselves on those levels. That's the Saturn moon opposition. Okay? But now we got Neptune and the Pars fortune. Neptune rules our faith, where we put our hope, where we want to believe in the goodness. You know? And the Pars fortune, that's a place of that's a place of opportunity. Okay? So the keynote, when we bring all this together, faith plus work plus opportunity will equal harvest. So again, this is a this is another overtone saying this is a magi year. But you can't be a magi with a whole lot of pain and separation trapped inside of you. That's gonna be a distraction, right? You're trying to focus on your vision, you you want to harness and manifest your powers, but then these traumatic experiences keep replaying themselves in your mind and, and bringing up all this pain in your heart. It's not gonna work, okay? Y'all with me on that? Yeah. All right, so now we talked about this Pluto conjunct sun in Capricorn. 11 degrees Capricorn is where the sun is every new year. 11 degrees Capricorn, very significant celestial placement. Without getting too deep, I'm just going to tell you this with what, what in the Book of Enoch would be called the sixth heaven. We know there's seven heavens, right? First heaven being our atmosphere, second heaven being the ionosphere, third heaven being the lunar sphere, the place between Earth and the moon, fourth heaven being the solar sphere the whole solar system. Fifth heaven is the planet Sirius. Sixth heaven, sixth heaven is the star constellation of Vega along with a long stretch of the Milky Way spiral arm which traverses from about nine degrees Capricorn to 16 degrees Capricorn. And the seventh heaven is the center of our galaxy the galactic core, which is a point of light at 27 degrees Sagittarius, also known as Sagittarius A. So, six heaven, I'm gonna tell you the significance of it. We know, right, uh, now, on one level, January 1st seems like a real arbitrary day to start the year, right? It's not a solstice, it's not an equinox, it ain't a new moon, right? It just seems real arbitrary. But, but I'm here to tell you, Babylon doesn't do nothing arbitrary. 
Okay, and how do we know it's not arbitrary? Cooper's and pudding. They got their space-time matrix pretty much on lock. Right? Most people, not us in here, but most people, they are locked in the Babylon space-time matrix. I'm telling you. Right? So how does January 1st, how does that play into it? It's because the sun every year is at 10, 11 degrees Capricorn, conjunct the sixth heaven, which is really like, again, without trying to get all deep into it, it's the celestial government. The galactic government resides in, in that sixth heaven. So the power and authority within the galaxy, this is where it is centered in Capricorn. If you think about the themes of Capricorn, Capricorn deals with authority, those in charge, the boss, the man, those that are established, right? How, why, how is that? It's the sixth heaven, all right? So this is where the sun is every January 1st. For about the past three or four years, when you look at the sun on January 1st, the planet Pluto is right there. Okay? Pluto, on one level, represents the principle of homeopathy on a celestial scale. This is the smallest planet, right? They even demoted it. They said it was a planet, you know, like a, a mini planet, right? They recently said, nah, you know what? It is a real planet. They, they, but once, once it hit this sixth heaven, they were like, yeah, we're going to give it its full authority. Right? But uh, Pluto deals with our alignment and relationship with truth. Are we aligned with, we all have relative truth. None of us can have an absolute truth. The key is how aligned is our relative truth to absolute truth. Okay? Pluto makes us deal with that. Pluto makes us deal with how we use and misuse our power. Okay? So, how is this manifesting? Anyone who is in charge, an authority, a leader, they're real, they're, they're Alignment with truth, their use of power, how they manage resources. All of those things is really coming into question. And we see it throughout all levels of society. You know, from school principals to coaches to world leaders. Okay? And just heads up, April 16th through most of September, Pluto's going to be retrograde. Retrograde means that uh, really the time to worry about retrograde is when it's going direct, because basically retrograde is like the Sankofa bird, right? You want to move forward, but up, you got to look back and, and resolve some actions, thought patterns, behaviors of the past before you can move forward, right? So that's what retrograde means. We'll be talk, retrograde is gonna be a theme we talk about as we go along, but uh, just keep that in mind as far as Pluto, all right? Yes, April 16th through September 25th, basically most of September. All right. Now, whoo, Saturn. Saturn is the ruler of Capricorn. Saturn represents everything that comes to us through our own sweat, toil, effort. Saturn is the cost of living on the earth plane. Things we got to do for food, clothing, and shelter. The discipline, responsibility, and obedience we have to demonstrate to be part of society. 
Okay? Saturn had been in Scorpio the past two and a half years. Okay? Scorpio deals with our uh, desires, our passions, things we feel real deeply about. It rules our sexuality, right? It rules other people's property and all of the resources that are out in creation that impact our life. So imagine a major devastation occurs in the Midwest and all the crops that we would be eating in the summertime get dashed away. That's a Scorpio phenomenon. Y'all with me? Because those are resources that are outside of ourselves that they impact in our life. Okay? So Saturn has been in, like I said, Saturn has been in uh, Scorpio the past two and a half years. And we've had issues more than likely, we've had issues in those areas. A, 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 a special need for sexual discipline or experiencing the consequences of not being disciplined in that area. Maybe having issues around our desires, total revamping of what we think we want. You know? So when Saturn first went into Scorpio, we thought, we might have thought we wanted one thing. By the time Saturn was leaving Scorpio, we might feel we need something totally different. Okay? And uh, again, this issue of resources, right? The past two and a half years, it's been tight. The Ujima and Ujama has been a little tight, right? But now, Saturn is father time, he rules time. Sagittarius is space. When ruler, and, and Jupiter, Jupiter is a planet that rules space. Sagittarius is the sign that rules space, okay? Space is all about abundance. It's infinite space. Saturn and time is all about limit and lack. Is there, never, is there ever enough time? You know? Not until we start on being on that eternal plane. But while we in this realm, Saturn will always make us feel like there's never enough time. Right? However, when the ruler of time enters a house or sign of space, that's usually opportunity. Okay? What plus what equals success? What plus what equals success? Preparedness and opportunity. So Saturn represents preparedness. Sagittarius represents opportunity. So again, this is kind of, this is aligning with this theme of the Magi here. This is the Magi state. Because we can, uh, if, if we prepare, if we are prepared, opportunities and success is going to be a part of this year. Y'all with me? Yes. All right. Oh, let me mention this too. Because Saturn does bring challenges wherever it goes. Sagittarius rules international relations, right? So, right, if we, we've lived 13 years of dramatic war, right. right? But, yeah, it might even get a little more intense these next two and a half years, okay? Wars on multiple fronts between multiple nations a breakdown of international relations and inter means of international communication. Issues of international morality coming to a head, all right? You're also going to have Sagittarius is I influence. Key word of Sagittarius is I influence, right? So, 
Sagittarius is the realm in social relations where one person's thoughts can inspire and influence another, right? It also rules media and broadcasting, right? That's also the realm of what we call the fanatic. The realm of the fanatic is Sagittarius. That's right. Where, where strong beliefs and dogma are imposed on the other. So Saturn is going to cause those issues to come up, but also reformation. This is going to be a time where fanatics go too far and get the reverse effect that they were anticipating. Like in Paris. Like in Paris. Like Charlie, Paris. right. How you had millions of people come out against that fanatic act. There was also a next one uh, in Pakistan. The school where 140 children were taken out by so-called Islamic fundamentals. Is that ISIS? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure which branch it was because I don't know the CIA behind them all, actually. Exactly. All right? We ain't even going to get into that tonight, right? But uh, uh, it had the reverse effect. I think it was the Taliban. It was. It was the Taliban. They said, they said it was the Taliban who raided a school and killed 140 children. And they had the reverse effect where the Pakistani average man was like, yo, we coming after the Taliban. Like, we, you know, y'all went too far. So fanatical reforms. Something we can anticipate in the next two and a half years. When Saturn was in Scorpio, we might have experienced issues with our reproductive organs. That is going to shift. I'm not acting out of emotional pain. I'm not making decisions that impact a nation based on some pain I experienced when I was nine years old and can't let go. Right? So that's why Malachi is the king stone and a crown jewel. Malachi as a crown jewel represents emotional nobility. Okay? So if we're not disciplined, responsible, uh, proactive, while Saturn's going direct, we're going to have to deal with it when Saturn goes retrograde. Okay? Moon in Taurus represents homeland. Might be uh, other. Uh, 14 started out with two out of the three beneficent planets retrograde, Venus and Jupiter. Beneficent planet is like planets we, that feel good, right? Venus, Venus brings our art, our culture. Venus is the currency of cash flow circulating in. Right? Everything that's beautiful. Venus. The feminine principle. Venus. Right? Jupiter. We mentioned Jupiter. Jupiter is the ruler of space. If Saturn represents everything that comes to us through our own toil and effort, Jupiter represents everything that comes to us from just being a citizen of an abundant omniverse. You walking by the mango tree, the mango fall. Right. Give thanks. That's Jupiter. All right. You just get a blessing. Someone just call you up. You was on my, you was in my prayer, you was in my dreams last night. The spirit told me to just give you a blessing. Bam. Wow. Right? That just happened to me. That's Jupiter. We started last year with 
to beneficence, retrograde, meaning it was that Sankofa bird was flying with these two planets, right? And uh, what it signified is that, because Venus also represents our values, what we think is important, right? That our values may have undermined or limited our opportunities. And, our, and with Jupiter retrograde, our opportunities may turn out to be regretful, right? How I really see this manifested collectively, now that we're, like, we can look <laughs> retrospect at 2014, is that fracking. Now y'all, now y'all, New York? That's right. Right. Y'all state government played it right. Yeah. Y'all say, nah, we're not gonna deal with that. Me, Pennsylvania, what? They put the whole shebang into fracking. Gave Shell a billion dollar tax break. What? No money to, no money for the schools. No money for road work. Worst bridges in the country. Wow. Seriously, this is the state of Pennsylvania. Right? They said fracking was going to bring so much revenue, so much jobs to the states that it was worth it. The values, what they thought was important, limited and undermined opportunities. And I think that that is a microcosm of the whole nation with this fracking. Why? Because now we see what's happening with the price of gas. Fracking was quote unquote worth it when gas was four dollars a gallon. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is your water, clean water, worth two dollars a gallon? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So this is how this Jupiter and Venus retrograde manifested 2014. This year, 2015. Venus is direct, if thanks, but we still starting this year with Jupiter retrograde. Jupiter's retrograde right now, okay? And remember, this January 1st is not an arbitrary day. This day really does set a tone for the year, aligning with this sixth heaven, all right? So, with Jupiter retrograde, even though this is the Magi, like we in our Magi state, this is the Magi year, we cannot overexpect or overextend. So even though we can manifest our heart's desire this year, we have to be wise and practical and prudent and what we are still instilling in our heart to manifest. Are y'all with me? Yes. Oh yeah. All right. And and look, I, before even the Flake Gate came out, I said deflation is going to be a theme for this year. Little did I know it was going to be even a theme within the Super Bowl with the deflate, with the Patriots, the oh, yeah. in their balls. Right? <laughs> to get into the uh, champions, into the Super Bowl. Wow. So deflation is going to be a theme for the year. For the country. Right? With this gas. Because see, the thing is, cheap gas feels good to us at the pump. But what's going We only got about three or four real banks left in this country. And all companies fracking, where do they get their loans to build their infrastructure from? These three or four banks. So can't be paid. Wow. These three or four banks might be a judgment that everyone feels. Okay? It might be a judgment everyone feels. So we got to pay attention to deflation. Also, what they call the EU, European Union, with Greece and 
the debt government dynamics of Greece deflating the euro. Okay? So now, you mentioned Jupiter started retrograde, but Jupiter's in Leo. If there's no other signifier of Magi state, it's Jupiter and Leo. Leo is our creative self. I create. I will. Whatever it is that your will wants to create and manifest and then come out of you, that's your Leo. And remember, we said Jupiter represents everything that comes to us without our own effort, just being a citizen of an abundant omniverse. Yes. Right? So, yeah. Creating our heart's desire through self-mastery. Leo's also about self-mastery. Mastering your will. Okay? So it really is that time for that uh, magi magic. And Jupiter will go direct in April. April 8th, okay? 2014, we started the year with a deep opposition. We had Uranus and Aries in strong opposition to Mars and Libra. Uranus rules technology, right? Aries rules the head, but also our identity. And 2014, we predicted that there was going to be real problems with like virtual identity, cyber relationships, biometrics, and identity theft. And this is what 2014 was all about. Major corporations getting hacked and people's personal information getting stolen, right? Over 100 million. In Target alone, you had 70 million data files compromised. Okay? So. Sony got hacked. That's right. Sony, uh, Home Depot, Target, right? Now, 2015, because now Mars is where the action is. So that's why, like that, that thing was in the news almost every week. There was some news about some data breach. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. 2015, you don't hear it. It's just, it's like what? It's just right? like the Ebola thing. The whole thing with the Ebola, and now you don't hear anything about it. That's right. Well, now, because Mars is where the action is. So now Mars is what? We started 2015 with Mars in hard opposition to this Jupiter and Leo. All right, Mars in Aquarius. All right, now Jupiter, excuse me, Leo also represents like the kings, the monarchs, the 1%, the people that, you know, their will is manifest throughout society. Right? The figurehead. <laughs> Aquarius rules the masses. We're, we're the Aquarius. Right? So, even though it is kind of quieted down, Ferguson, mm -hmm. New York, mm -hmm. right? All them things, that's still going to be a thing. That's going to be a big thing this year. It's quieted down for a minute because I think Jupiter's retrograde. Once Jupiter goes direct, it's going to be a lot more social unrest. Advancing of Aquarian ideals and challenging the, 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 the figureheads, the leaders, the 1% whose will is manifesting a social order. It's going to be a lot of challenges towards that. All right? It's going to be, yeah, a lot of uh, burning and looting, <laughs> right? It's going to be a lot of burning and looting in 2015. But meanwhile, we're to master our emotions. Yes, yes. But now, 
sad to say, mass rule and mob rule, right, which is Aquarian, very hard to master and control. Right. That thing kind of has a mind of its own, right? And so, yeah, probably for us, we need to be examples of how to resist wisely. This game is chess, it's not checkers. We're not just trying to jump. Nah, we got to think three, five steps ahead. If I burned down my neighborhood hardware store, right, it felt good in that moment, mm -hmm. but what's next? Mm -hmm. You know? So now, are y'all cool? Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's get into these astrological megatrends, and these are determined by the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. These are very slow-moving planets, right? Because they're, they're far out. Uranus move, moves, it takes about seven and a half years for Uranus to move through a, a, a sign. Wow. It takes Neptune about 16 years, 14 years, excuse me. And it takes Pluto anywhere from 16 to 24 years to move through a sign. Wow. So these are the planets responsible for like what we would call generational effects, right? How children born in the 60s is different from children born in the 70s, is different from children born in the 80s, right? How is that reflected or manifested astrologically? It's the placement of the outer planets, okay? Y'all with me? Yeah. yeah. All right, so. Uh, right, I kind of mentioned this. Uranus is about seven and a half years per sign. Takes Uranus 84 years to make a complete circuit. Neptune is about 14 years. It takes it 165 years to make a complete circuit. <laughs> Pluto, the average is 20 years. It takes anywhere. Some, some signs, Pluto has an elliptical orbit. So some signs, it's only in there for like 16 years. Some signs, it's in there for 24 years. So we just say average, about 20 years, right? Right now, Uranus is in Aries, Neptune is in Pisces, Pluto is in Capricorn. And these are all causing long-term societal trends or mega trends that we are witnessing and living. Let's look at these things. We'll start with Uranus. Uranus rules revolution, equal rights and justice, social equality, the decision making of the masses, right? Aries rules the hot and arid regions and the desert places of the earth. And from the point that Uranus went into Aries, we've had what they call, what is it called, the Arab Spring, right? Starting with Tunisia, still going on in Syria. And we got our rap. Now, Uranus also rules chaos. Huh. And we know war brings chaos. Sudden change. Uranus rules sudden change. So this is, this is the thing that's going to be going on until 2018. Okay. Right. Uranus rules uranium. And we got Iran steadily on this quest to be a nuclear power. By 2018, I think that's going to happen. You got Uranus rules the lone gunman. The erratic individual that impacts society in a dramatic way. And that has been a theme from 2011. Okay, y'all can see I made this a while ago. Because right, this was the example I called upon at that time. You know, Gabrielle Gifford was the uh, <coughs> congresswoman from Arizona right. that was right. shot on the campaign trail right. by Jared Lee 
Loughner. Right. All right. But this has been a theme. You've had lone gunmen jumping off as a matter of fact. Oh, well, yeah, I'm going to get to that. <laughs> but now, Aries rules the head. Uranus rules technology. What's the hottest thing right now? What was the hottest thing you could get someone for Christmas this year? Biochip. Say what? Beats headphones. Beats headphones. Biochip. Beats headphones. They ain't charging three hundred dollars. Yo, three hundred dollars for some headphones. They cost twenty in China. I'm sure. They worth twenty. Come on. You know, you can't tell me they sound like they worth three hundred dollars. I'm not gonna try one. You'd have to tell me, and I'm still. I'm not gonna believe you. Right, but this this is this Uranus in Aries, all right. Because the whole idea is to have this technology up on your head, Bluetooth, headphones, cell phone up on your head, and it's ultimately they want it to progress where you get the implant, mm -hmm. get the microchip, biochip. the biochip implanted in your head. By 2018, uh, American Express last year released a press release that says they anticipate the United States being a cashless society by 2016. So this is American Express. Okay? So by 2018, these head implants might be a social norm. That's why Tucson is important because we need alternative means of barter and exchange. We need alternative currencies to the fiat, the fake dollar. Ross. The dollar, yes. Um, you know Google um, had a, a recall on those glasses. Yes, you know, the, 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 the Google glasses, yes. They had a big recall on it. Give thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why? Well, I don't know. Something with the technology. Yeah, it was a glitch. Where it was a glitch or something, and, and, and they recalled them, and they haven't been out since. Give yeah. thanks. Give thanks. You know? Okay. Yeah. And you know what? I'm seeing this because, boy, see, we. Mostly everyone in here, we were full grown adults when we were introduced to the intense technology of today. So it didn't impact our growth and development. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm seeing in my youth impact. how this technology impacts the developing mind. And it's not good. It's not good. And this whole idea of virtual reality, this idea that, and I see this in the youth, where they think it would be better, more enjoyable to have a virtual identity and a virtual reality than to live a real life. That's a mental crisis. <laughs> That's this Uranus and Aries. Because Aries rules our identity. The I am. When we say I am, that's first house. That's Aries. Whatever you finish that I am with, that's that first house. Excuse me, that's that Aries. Okay? So we got to help our children. Yes, we do. We got to help our children want to live a real life. And we probably got to even check our own selves as far as Facebook yes. and all them things. Don't get caught up. Don't get too caught up in them things. Yeah, you know? That's why it's important to take these uh, crystal trips. In yes, sir. Earth True that. Connect. True that. All right. So here's some 2014 manifestations of this Uranus and Aries. 74 school shootings last year. Damn. You hear that? Some of them must not even be making the news no more. <laughs> 74 school shootings. 
microchip implants in humans grow in popularity. Yeah. Okay. Israel, is it real? Jumping off. Terrorist gangsters in Syria. You know? All right. Where's my Colorado sisters at? Astrological mega trend we can all give thanks for. Yes. Neptune and Pisces. <coughs> Neptune rules liquids, oils, gases, vapors. Substances that influence the mind and body. And Pisces is all about surrender and acceptance, tolerance, right? So, right, what we're seeing now, what we're seeing now is really a progression. Right now, the topic of the herb is, right, let's decriminalize it. Let's make it a medicinal, right? But really, by 2025, when this thing, when Neptune finishes its transit in Pisces, mm -hmm. her is going to fulfill the prophecy of the healing of the nation yes. and become a source of food, clothing, fuel, and shelter with the means of production in the hands of the masses. I'm going to say that again. Yes, say it. Because, to be honest, now, I'm so thankful what happened in Colorado happened in Colorado. Yes. Herb has really been de facto decriminalized in Philly. You can have to an ounce and get a $25 ticket now. Right? They don't even trouble you. You could be burning herb, but the police don't even trouble you now. Right? Yeah. So, that's a good thing. We're thankful, right? Because, because her has been an excuse to incarcerate yeah. indigenous people for a long time. But uh, this is, we really need to look beyond this. This, this is, this should not be the end game. The end game where we should all be informing ourselves and advancing society towards is her being food, fuel, clothing, shelter with the means of production in the hands of the masses. No corporate hand in between us and our food, fuel, clothing, and shelter. That's when Herb will fulfill its prophecy as the tree of life and the healing of the nations. And by 2025, we should witness that. Okay? <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Another trend we're going to see, and this, this has actually happened in Philly where we got some elders of some <laughs> Some elders in Philly got X hundred of acres of land in St. Elizabeth, right. and they're building Earthship Eco Villages. That's right. That we're gonna that they're gonna be able, we're gonna be able to go down there, see how to live sustainably, right. and then go and replicate it where the Creator places us directly on the land. That's right. All right. So. This communal living, intentional, self-sustained eco-villages expand and retreat from urban cities to harbor Pisces rules, the harbor places of the planet, the places where we can be safe yes, from impending catastrophes of whatever nature. That's Pisces. So, where spirit is going to be moving one and ones out of these urban environments right. in the harbor places. And we're going to, when we get there, we're going to be building intentional communities, learn, relearning how to live one with nature. Right. Okay? 
Now, Neptune is deep, though. We can't sleep on Neptune. Neptune rules what we want to believe. The things we want to believe, that's our blind spots to illusion. Because if I want to believe something, right, I'm going to turn off my mind power of discernment. I'm not going to critically think. Why? Because I want to believe. I want to believe what this person is telling me is real. So I'm not going to study their behavior, right? Because I want to believe what they're saying is for real. Right? I see the ladies is like, yeah, I, I, know, I, I know what you're talking about, right? So what's going to happen is, there's going to be two things happening. We're going to have some people whose dreams, hopes, wishes, because it's aligned with the divine, who thinks it's going to be manifesting. And then, look to your left, look to your right, you're going to see disillusionment, confusion, total dashing away of hopes, dreams, and values because they were misplaced. Okay? And then the despondency and the depression that comes out from that. All right? Y'all with me? Yes. All right. Now, he said Neptune rules oils and gases. <coughs> so Neptune has a big part of this fracking thing, too. And, and, and now, one thing I'll say, by 2025, by the time Neptune is leaving Pisces, there will be no more big oil. Dick Cheney and his boys will be out of here. But the reason why is because they're going to reap so much ecological disaster, we will no longer tolerate it. Now, with all the ecological disaster, they, they poisoned half the Gulf of Mexico, right? That's right. Did anybody, like, did we tolerate it? Collectively, we tolerated it. Am I correct? Yeah. Right now, they're fracking here, fracking there. People can light their faucet water on fire mm -hmm. in western Pennsylvania. We tolerate it. A lot of this is happy, because what? You're right. I bought gas for $1.97 a gallon driving up here today. In New Jersey. Dollar yeah. ninety seven. What you hear what I'm saying? Gas under two dollars. Who would have ever thought we'd have seen that day again? That's right. Of gas being under two dollars. But see that's that Neptune. Neptune's tricky. I wanna believe that's good. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's gonna be some it's gonna be some consequences, you know? So sad to say, sad to say, big oil is only gonna go out after they do something so buck nanas to the environment that we will no longer tolerate. And you can measure our own toleration for things that have occurred ecologically because of oil the past 20, 30 years, and you know it's gonna to have to be real dramatic. Okay, so now, now, you know, we're Neptunian people, did y'all know that? Yeah. We're Piscean people, did y'all know that? Yeah. Ones who went through the Ma'afa, ones who got ancestors that were fed to the deep Atlantic. Oh, okay. Right? Those who suffered great trial and tribulation, we are Piscean people. <laughs> We got, who got the vibe? We got the vibe. We got the vibe. That's right. Okay? So, and, and Pisces is all about holism, right? So I think there's going to be 
And, and, and we do kind of see it, a return to acoustic music, a leaving of the electronic music, and a return to more, right, Brother Joel was just like, uh, these are the real frequencies and the vibes we need to be dealing with. It's gonna be a return to the real vibes, acoustic music, okay? Also, holistic approaches to health care. Yes. Now, I don't know how Obamacare plays out in this, because initially, what I was observing was that uh, lack of access to insurance, lack of accessibility to affordable health care was moving people to be more holistic. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? That's true. So now I don't know with this now, uh, everyone can get insurance. I don't know how this is gonna play out. We gotta, we gotta watch this, okay? Um, but we ourselves, I think we need, those that are conscious and aware, we need to advance. We need to advance uh, holistic ways of wellness and institutionalizing. Now that is one trend that I see happening where, right, they got integrated medicine now. You go to a, a hostile pit with cancer, right, they still gonna blast you with radiation and douse you with chemotherapy, uh -huh. but then they are gonna also give you a massage. And they gonna, <laughs> they gonna feed you some macrobiotic miso soup. Right, right. So, the, and so they are integrated. Though holistic therapies are becoming institutionalized. Um, Rosalind, yes. I just wanted to touch on the Obamacare situation. I was listening uh, to a program the other day, uh, just to piggyback on what you were saying that everybody's going to be able to get this affordable, whatever they're given, but not everybody's going to be able to have a doctor mm. to, to to care for them. Per se. Let's say if, if you wanted to go to a dentist, maybe that dentist won't be available for like a month or so. Wow. Or, you know, your family practitioner won't be um, available for you to see. Yeah. So then it goes back to the emer going to the emergency room again. Mm. So quick. I don't know how good that. Real quick, just real quick, but what yeah. you just said. Yeah. That's why they advertise it in the train the new way to deal with your doctor. Right. And, and, and they have it with oh, virtual. Mm -hmm. Yes. Virtual appointments. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's some ways these Neptune and Pisces manifested in 2014. Ebola was definitely a Neptune and Pisces manifestation. Okay? Uh, beyond just the mystery around it, Neptune rules mysteries. Uh, but it does rule outbreaks and disease, okay? Epidemics. We already mentioned Colorado and Washington State freeing up the herd. Now, this debate around Keystone XL, if this is pushed through, that's gonna be an opportunity that turns out to be a, a big disappointment because of the issue of deflation. It's not going to pay off. The, the, the economic return versus the ecological destruction, it's not going to, it's not going to pay off. Okay? Now, Pluto and Capricorn. Pluto represents our subconscious urges. That something inside of us. This, we all know we got some, there's a part of us inside of ourselves that we got to work hard to control, right? Right? That's Pluto. We already mentioned Capricorn is authority figures. So we got this theme of these people in authority can't, can't keep their pants up, can't keep their skirts down, getting caught up in sex scandals. We even got this thing brewing where the, the international pedophile ring is getting exposed. Pluto deals with exposure, right? 
So this is going to be an ongoing thing. Anybody see this movie? The Girl Who Played With Fire? It's really a trilogy. Yeah. Yeah. It's real Pluto and Capricorn action right here. All right? Where, right, the sister took it on herself to avenge those who was in power, misusing it and abusing it and, and, and uh, just wilding out with this sexuality. Right? Capricorn rules the skeletal system. Capricorn rules the skull. Prior to Pluto moving into Capricorn, Pluto was in Sagittarius. Sagittarius rules professional sports, right? When Pluto was in Sagittarius, that's when the athletes was wilding out. Every other day, an athlete was in jail, getting locked up, beating up somebody in an automobile accident. <laughs> After 2008, it shifted to those who are in charge of professional sports. So for example, uh, Penn State, Joe Paterno, the winningest coach in college football history, a sex scandal took out his whole thing. Wow. They erased all his wins, right? Uh, this man, Andy Reid, his son, he hired his son to work for the preseason. He OD'd on heroin and died right there in that spring training. Wow. You know? So you had a shift where it wasn't the players, but the coaches. Now, what's, the, what's uh, right, homeboy from the Patriots with the deflate game? Right? So even if they continue to have winning seasons, they're going to be known as cheaters. No one's going to really respect their wins because they are they're cheaters. Right? Also, right? Like I said, Capricorn rules the skull. What has become the prominent issue as far as players? Head injuries and concussions. And what's a concussion? It's when the brain slams against the skull. Pluto deals with force, right? So that's how this Pluto and Capricorn is manifesting in a big way. Police, remember, those in authority, those in charge, those in control, that's Capricorn. The man, the boss, police are ruled by Capricorn. Pluto, use and misuse of power. Big theme, right? 2014, that was really probably the biggest theme news-wise. And it's still an ongoing thing. Police misuse of power. Now, by the time Pluto leaves Cap in 2023, we're probably going to see the rise and fall of a one-world government. You hear that? By the time Pluto leaves Capricorn in 2023, we're going to see the rise and fall of a one world government. That means all other nations is going to have to fall as sovereign countries in that process. So we got some dramatic things to see on an international level by the time 2023 comes around with this Pluto and Capricorn. Pluto, remember we said Pluto deals with resources, right? It's going to, and, and Capricorn is ruled by Saturn, the limiter. Real or fabricated limitations of resources, food shortages, fuel shortages, okay? Yeah, food and fuel so resources becoming limited, whether it's real or contrived. I already mentioned this, that uh, Pluto's conjunct the sixth heaven, the Vega constellation, Milky Way, right? Now, that means that the celestial government may intercede in 2015. It's meaning the star nations, right? Because Mama Kofuni said we want to tie this into the star nations, right? But my thing is, 
They haven't interceded yet. It's been pretty buck bananas down here on this planet. And they haven't interceded yet, right? So that means we have to ask an important question. What are they waiting for? What are they waiting for? More specifically, who are they waiting for? Right? So uh, I'm going to take a pause at this point. Because this is the end of part one. How y'all feel? Y'all ready? You want to just right, keep, right, it, keep right. it moving? Y'all good? Because right. you know, a lot of times, I, right, coming after the brethren, right? Must be on their nods, you know? <laughs> but I'm glad to see y'all still awake. So we want to just keep it moving. Y'all got any questions in the meanwhile? Any questions, comments, thoughts? Why well, it's mid the midnight oh. Iowa. Oh, right. Yes. Uh, there's an article that came out in multiple uh, sources. Um, they're actually starting to question artificial intelligence that's going to come down the pipeline pretty soon. And they're saying that um, they predict that the artificial intelligence is going to literally turn on the hmm. yeah. Singularity. What? Turn on humanity. They show it in the movies all the time. That's what they call the singularity, I think. So uh, I'm gonna talk about I wanna talk about the star nation, but I wanna do it, I wanna come a little different. Okay? Because usually in my Star Nations presentations, it like gives the impression that uh, which is true, that there's this pyramid mothership. And there's these interdimensional light beings appearing in our atmosphere, right? Looking like they, they're going to help us. They're going to save us, right? But uh, like I said, how I ended that first part, if they was going to shut this thing down, like, like what's it going to take for the celestial government to come down and shut down these rogue governments, right? And enforce international morality, reestablish indigenous sovereignty. What's it gonna take? What's it gonna take, y'all? Waking up. Yeah, I think the thing is, they honor one important universal law, which is what? Free will. <clears throat> Meaning, they're not going to just come in and do something for us if, number one, it's not even our will or intention to receive their help. But even beyond that, they're really waiting for us. Like I said, what are they waiting for? Who are they waiting for? They're waiting for us to shut this thing down. So I'm going to talk, that's what I'm going to kind of focus on today. How can we, what can we do to shut this thing down, right? And uh, it's called Heavens Are Open, Conduit Closed, Philadelphia, Montauk, Long Island, and the Gates of Hell. Mm -hmm. This is some very important information. All right, so now... Quick overview for, any, for folks who might not have seen any of my Star Nations presentations. Real quick, there's a pyramid mothership that has been appearing in and out of our atmosphere on a regular basis since about 2009. There's thousands of clips on YouTube showing it, all right? You can search pyramid mothership. You can search diamond UFO. You can search, uh, just search mothership, okay? I'm not, gonna, I'm, not, I'm not even gonna spend a lot of time on that because really I wanna get beyond this. If, if uh, I also, I do got some DVDs available of the heavens are open, all right? If you want like some of the background, right? So we got this pyramid mothership appearing who is it real quick? It's Ra's Ark of a Million Years returning. The, Dom, the uh, Dogon will call it the Coronat, the Ark of the Pure Earth. You see they got a rock carving. Pyramid Mothership usually has a smaller 
octahedron shaped ship with it, Dogon rock carving depicting the two together, right? I'm not gonna get into all of that. The why it's called the mothership is because there's these interdimensional light beams that travel with it. Okay, here's some footage of them. They're known as the orbs. Right? But I'm going to just keep it moving. In Kemet, they were called the Anui. The Dogon called them the Nomo Titiani. In Ethiopia, they were called the Ofan. The Book of Enoch describes them in depth. Okay? Being the third highest order of angelic being after the seraphim and the cherubim. Okay? Again, I'm not going to get all deep into the background. Right, but here is uh, some classic footage of the Ophan, right? And as you see, they even travel in angelic script. Like the way the way their formations are, it's 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 writing. Okay. Hmm. All right, so we're going to keep it moving. I just want to let y'all see that the orbs make crop circles. So this whole phenomenon of the crop circles, the Ophan, the orbs, they're responsible for that. And the, and the crop circles is one of their primary ways of communicating with us. Y'all with me on that? All right, we're going to study two very important crop circles to understand how we can shut this thing down. The first is... Uh, knowing that the Ophan are our celestial brethren and sistren. This, this is a picture not too great of resolution of what is considered the most important crop circle ever. It was a response to a binary message. Carl Sagan, the uh, astrophysic uh, scientist, sent into the heavens using the uh, Arecibo Telescope of Puerto Rico in 1974. He sent a message up that said, hey, we use a decimal counting system. We have five elements that make up our, our, our biological chemistry. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. This is the formula for our DNA. We have two strands in our DNA uh, molecule. The average human is five feet, nine inches. There's X million of us up on a planet. We're on the third planet from the sun, and we sent this message using the Arecibo telescope. So that's a real quick breakdown of what Carl Sagan sent up to the heavens. The response, they said, hey, we use a decimal counting system too. We have five elements that make up our biochemistry, but where you have carbon, we have silica. We have three, three strands of DNA. We live on the third, fourth, and fifth planet of our solar system. There's 21.3 billion of us, and we gave this message through an orb. Y'all with me? All right. Next to that uh, data strip was a pixelated image of them. Only crop circle ever depicted with pixels. What's the message in that? I'm with my brethren right here. I want to take a selfie with me and him. Right? That's going to be in a pixelated format. Right? So they're saying this is a selfie. All right? Now, who, who are these? Last time I was here at Nicholas, uh, Black Magi interviewed me. And then I didn't even... I didn't even I, because I had never even seen that movie, Guardians of the Galaxy. And I've since seen it and regret that I referenced it, because that movie was horrible, right? But uh, I more or less said, hey, black people are the Guardians of the Galaxy, right? So I got a whole lot of crazy hateration on YouTube, which is, you know, I'm not surprised. But anyway. I wanted to show this because this is one of those beings. And this was leaked footage of the Apollo 20 mission. Oh, show that in part two, Rosalind. I'm glad you show it now. Thank you, brother. So 
This is a, a woman, an indigenous woman that they found on the dark side of the moon. Okay? Giant mothership. And a giant mothership. Now, a lot of people say it's a hoax. I don't know. My thing is, if they would hoax it, who would they? White. Who? <laughs> white and who? White, what gender? Man. A white man. Barack Ben is a white man who, because when I did it in Enlightenment Part 2 and I showed it, I showed the white, the white guy who is worked for NASA. Who leaked when, this. Who, he's the one who leaked it. He's an astronaut and he comes straight up and he leaked it. Yeah. And William Rutledge. William Rutledge. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So it's not a fake. It's not fake at all. And the city is still on the moon. Were they trying to open our eyes? No, this was the navigation instrument that they surgically removed from her. That first footage that we saw was after they removed this. They think that she steered the ship with this instrumentation attached to a node on her first eye, her eyes, nose, and mouth. So probably by singing and thinking, she navigated her ship, right? Sun Ra, how does Sun Ra say we travel in space waves? Opposite side of time. With what? Opposite side of time. Well, but with an orchestra. That was what I was looking for. Sun Ra, Sun Ra traveled the space waves with a what? With an orchestra. You gotta meditate on that. All right, so right, we've heard all this information. William Rutledge, uh, yeah, we know we have to get into all that. But now, you notice how she looked like Clay? Because she's not, she don't have carbon. She don't have carbon, she got silica. They told us, right? They don't have carbon, we got silica. So she's silica based, we're carbon based. This is what she looks like materialized. This is what they look like etherealized. So these orbs are not like, they're not spacecraft, they're like beings. We saw that. Right? Because okay. silica is what? Quartz. Silica is quartz, exactly. We saw it in the caves. When we these went. are some recent, this was. Uh, Late December, Pyramid Mothership flew up from Nevada up to Oregon. Seen by thousands, recorded by many, made the news in several places. They called it the Mystery Fireball. I'm not even going to stay on this because we're moving. I'm honoring your time. All right? This we had a fleet of orbs December 27 over Philadelphia. Thousands of them. Okay? These are some true South Philly cats. I, I, I wish we had time to listen to the audio. It was just as entertaining as seeing the orbs, you know? But we had fleets of thousands of orbs. You see them. This was over Philadelphia December 27. So these are recent. Just showing you some recent phenomena, all right? But we're going to keep it moving. Yeah, because of time. Yes, I know. How much time we got? Zero. Zero time? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, right, because I, I, where I'm going, I don't think I could go with zero no, you, time. you can't. All right. So Cause the long and the short, if y'all familiar with the Montauk Project, right? Touch into it a little bit. Come on. You can't give it up like that. All right. Put it on. All right, this right here, oh, second God. most important crop circle. These men. Second most important crop circle. Binary code expressed in the ASCII key that had a message that said, beware the bears of false gifts and their broken promises. Yes. Mm -hmm. Much pain, but still time. Believe this good out there. We oppose deception. The conduit is closing. So a conduit is a portal. What is the portal that is open that is allowing this thing to continue? It is the tear and the space-time continuum that is over Philadelphia and New York, mm. Mm. all right? 
going back from the Philadelphia Experiment in 1943 to the Montauk Project of 1983. So there's a giant hole in the fabric of space-time that spans 40 years, 43 to 83, and spans the space from the Philadelphia Naval Yard to the Montauk uh, Naval Base at the tip of Long Island. Y'all with me? Yes. All right. So I had a whole lot of proof about that. Y'all just going to take my word for it. And what do we have to do? We have to close the conduit. That's what the star nations are waiting on. They're waiting for us to close the conduit. The conduit was actually first opened up by Ben Franklin. That's what I was going to get into. All right. Showing how Ben Franklin, who was a member of the Hellfire Society of England, Right? Major Satanists. Y'all can research that yourself. When they excavated Ben Franklin's house in England, what did they find in the basement? Skeletons. Skeletons of children and women. What? Yeah. Do you know that? No. All right. So, on the Ben Franklin Parkway in Philadelphia, it's an unobtrusive museum called the Rodan Museum. Okay, I will show you some footage of that. Y'all, y'all seen this sculpture before? The Thinker, right? Mm -hmm. Most famous sculpture you can visualize. You say visualize the sculpture, what's gonna come to your mind? The Thinker. This is right here on the Ben Franklin Parkway. Who knew that this thing was in Philadelphia? <laughs> I didn't. Okay, this thing's right here at the Ben Franklin Parkway in front of the Rodin Museum, which is set up as a Roman mausoleum. There's more of a museum underground than it is above ground. The thinker is part of a theme of sculptures that is collectively known as the Gates of Hell. The, the role of the of thinker, hell. the Gates of Hell are conjured in the minds of man. Okay, you think about Kemet, how we would, when you would find us in Kemet, uh, in a meditative stance, our, our spines was erect, everything was erect. Look at the thinker. What you thinking about if you all like this? Right. Okay. He conjures up the gates of hell, which is a giant door on the Rodan Museum that depicts all of the suffering and torment that occurs in the seven hells of Dante's Inferno, with a focus on the second hell. Okay? This is, and look, they got a miniature, so you had the big thinker outside, and you got a smaller thinker on the gates of hell with all the torment and suffering going on. The funny thing is, is that you're going into these museums and everything, and you're not even aware of what they represent. What they're representing. That's right. And what gateways? You and what gateways we're? What, we're what you, yes. So now, why have a Gates of Hell museum in honor of Ben Franklin on the Ben Franklin Parkway? Because, like I said, he worked for the Hellfire Society, and uh, Ben Franklin actually birth the United States at 2.13 a.m. on July 4th, 1776, putting the seven and a half degrees of Gemini on the rising, which is the gates of hell. Seven and a half degrees Sagittarius is the gates of heaven. Remember we said the seventh heaven is in Sagittarius. Mm. 27 degrees Sagittarius. The gate to it is seven and a half degrees Sagittarius. If I make a 180 degree opposition right. and go to the opposing degree, I'm at seven and a half degree Gemini, which is the gates of hell. Mm. All right. So Franklin raised hell for the Hellfire Club of England mm. by birthing the United States. Okay, and that is why. And so when we look at the when we look at that chart, we got Uranus on the cusp. Uranus rules what? Tech. Knowledge. Technology. Remember that message? It said, what? Beware the bearers of false gifts, which is what? Technology. Technology and their broken promises. So Ben Franklin opened up. Why is the United States the inventor of all technological 
things that have transformed how everyone is living. This goes back to Ben Franklin opening up these gates in hell. And uh, uh, now, big part of this port, oh, wow. how is it connected to England? Line. Pennsylvania is the what state? Brother. That's Philadelphia city, brother. Pennsylvania is the <laughs> what state? Keystone. Keystone. Oh. All right. And how is it I can draw a straight line from the Keystone State to Stonehenge? Mm. All right. So a gate has a couple of moving parts a key and hinge. Stonehenge, Keystone. Y'all with me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm moving real fast. That's the Philadelphia Experiment. Look at the movie, Philadelphia Experiment, one and two. You'll see how they manipulate space time. Okay? And this is where the Philadelphia Experiment occurred, right off the Naval Yard in Philadelphia, where the Schuylkill Hill and Delaware rivers come together, right near Tinicum, uh Reserve, Nature Reserve, and the Philadelphia International Airport. Okay, and this occurred August 12th, 1943. They ripped, without, y'all look at the movie to get the details, but this day they ripped a big hole in the fabric of space time. Mm -hmm. 40 years later, August 12th, 1983, they replicated the same thing on Montauk Long Island, ripped open another hole in the fabric of space-time. So now you've got a fort. This hole is 40 years, big time-wise, and a whole degree of latitude space-wise. Hmm. The whole 40th degree. Okay, because beyond Long Island is the 41st degree. Below Philadelphia is the 39th degree. Y'all with me? This yes. Is, this is, I don't know if you've seen that movie, uh, Interstellar. Not yet. But I, there was a part in there where they was talking about the wormhole, and they said that we finally got our escape because 40 years ago, this wormhole was there. And it was just using the 40 years. And mm. that's when the wormhole appeared. Mm. It was 40 years ago. Mm. Yeah, all them entities, brother Joel was talking about. <laughs> yeah. Fourth gate, dimension. The gates of hell. All right. So now, what are the star nations waiting for? To get out. We got to close the conduit. My charge to y'all. Y'all got to, when I mean, you meditate, you're close visualizing your, your new ride and your and yeah, the clean, ballicious new house, and you know, zeros on your bank account, and all, all the things that, yeah, you should spend time putting mental energy to that. To close we gotta close gate. the conduit, conduit too. Conduit closed. Conduit closed. We closing the gates of hell. And how do I see it? I visualize a big hole Spanning Philly to New York, and then I just see that jump. Done. I just see it close Done. up, and I said, "Conduit closed." The things they don't teach you in school. So we need to be doing that collectively, and then maybe we'll see a next move from the Star Nation. But we can't just keep sitting and waiting. waiting. But that's a program, Rossman. That's a program that the system has implanted in people, like the die to go to heaven right. uh, vibration, or you have to wait and you have right. to, you know, right. it's a program. So waiting is a waste of time, actually. True that. So I know I went fast through that second part, but I think y'all got it, right? Yeah, yeah. Great. Yes, sir. So give thanks for your time. Give thanks for your attention. All right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah. Hey. Right. And I will put out the final call where this Monday I'm going to the Tucson Gender Mineral Show.
Y'all want to get your pre-orders in? This is the time. Don't come at me in March talking about Ross. I want some watermelon tourmaline. <laughs> Ross ain't gonna be able to do nothing for you in March. That's right. Okay. Right. Cause they getting red. You want your mobile bike? You want your Heliodor? Now's the time to pre-order. All right. Thank you, Mama Kafunia. Thank you, Sister Monique. Baba Joel. Nicholas. New York. Give thanks. Much love. The first prophecy of her as the tree of life and the savior for humanity is found in the book of Enoch.